Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this workshop. This is the third in the series, and I've had the pleasure of participating in the first two. Um, today's topic is very important, using modern statistical modeling methods to extract information on disparities in Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease related dementia from already available data. We'll hear a, a great diversity of approaches, um, all of them focused on this theme. Uh, so I really very much look forward to hearing what everyone has to say. Uh, and now I'll uh, let the rest of the program uh, proceed. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our National Institute of Aging sponsored workshop. Uh, such kind of workshop was a part of a strategic plan for biodemography of aging research unit, BARU. And uh, uh, together with Eric Stoddard, Kenneth Land, and uh, Jim Wapel, I am co-director of BARU. And I would like briefly to inform you about activity in the biodemography of aging research unit, uh, which is related to health disparities, studies of health disparities uh, and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, to my view, uh, very important changes started at Duke Group uh, more than 40 years ago when the fundamental paper published uh, in 1979 by Jim Wapel, Conmenten, uh, and Eric Steller uh, talked about how hidden heterogeneity influence age trajectories of mortality. And uh, the important point was that age modulated by the distribution of hidden heterogeneity, which is what's called demographic frailty in this study. The main insight from this uh, paper was that if somebody would like to improve human mortality, uh, he or she should change the distribution of hidden heterogeneity. He should identify this heterogeneity and make the changes. More detailed analysis shows that heterogeneity is not necessarily fixed, it's changing over time. So to deal with uh, changing heterogeneity, represented by longitudinal data, uh, the team developed uh, new models, stochastic process model and longitudinal grade of membership model. So now we have tools for analyzing this data and this tool is uh, each time this tool is getting better and more adjusted to existing data. And uh, our analysis of national long-term uh, care survey data detected trends an improvement of cognitive health. That's uh, Eric Steller's most uh, efforts about this. And very important insight from this is that uh, cognitive health could change without any new medications. There are some processes in our society which could probably relate to progress in uh, uh, improving situation of other diseases, which could influence uh, cognitive health, including Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this, this is a very important issue, and we have grants from NIA about this. Uh, the amount of data related to the problem is continuing to increase. Now, a lot of genetic data are added to the field, and uh, adding genetic data requires to update the models, and in particular, we have genetic version of stochastic process model, and uh, the analysis of roles of gene environment interaction is now uh, a very important challenge. For statisticians, studying gene environment interaction is just adding the interaction term into the regression model. For biodemographers, gene environment interaction is, means dealing with stress and stress response. So the persistent psychosocial stress, for instance, uh, influence uh, allostatic increase in allostatic load, and this uh, increase risk of Alzheimer's disease and many other health disorders. New aspects of health disparity includes only st also studying genetic mechanism of stress perception. Uh, the main point here is that there are some um, important consequences of exposure to different harmful uh, environmental conditions. We, and our uh, brain has an emotional memory. 
and this emotional me memory produce uh, variability in perception of stress. It means that people uh, meeting the same kind of stressful conditions could respond differently. And uh, one people will not just, uh, just ignore the stressful situation and some other produce some long lasting stress response, which could increase allostatic load and increase the risk of uh, disease and death. So that's uh, briefly what we are doing. And we could discuss all these issues if it's uh, interesting in our discussion session. So I have no doubt that this workshop will further clarify situation with health disparities in the United States, produce useful insights concerning the next step for improving situation with cognitive health in this country, and stimulate fruitful collaboration among researchers in this area. Thank you. All right, I think I'm next. I'm uh, Heather Whitson. I'm the director of the Duke Aging Center and also of the new Duke UNC Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So I've attended this conference series and have always very much appreciated um, the series. I always find it informative and stimulating. And I'm delighted that this time we're also able to say that we're hosting it here at Duke, a location that has an NIA designated Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. It is a Duke UNC Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And our tagline is that when it comes to fighting Alzheimer's disease, we're all on the same team. After what happened Saturday, I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> when it comes to fighting Alzheimer's disease, we're all on the same team. Um, and I'll just, I just wanna sort of comment on the themes of the Duke UNC Alzheimer's Disease Center and how well they perfectly um, synchronize with, with many of the themes that you'll hear in this conference here today. And of course, that's no um, surprise. It's not a coincidence either. The work of the um, Biodemography Aging Research Unit certainly informs the center because one of the center's jobs is to leverage and highlight the strengths um, of, of Alzheimer's disease work on, on uh, the campuses and, and that go on locally. And certainly Baru um, is one of, as I've described it, the many pearls um, that were in Alzheimer's disease research and the, the role of the center is really to organize them into a necklace um, as well as to create a few new pearls. So the two themes that um, are uh, driving the work that we do in the center. One is to take a life course approach to Alzheimer's disease. So uh, the theme is stated as um, looking for factors across the lifespan that contribute to the development, the progression, or the experience of Alzheimer's disease. And that certainly fits well um, with the uh, Baru's approach as well. And then in addition to that, focusing on disparities and trying to look at the many health inequities related to Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and using our local Eastern North Carolina, the diversity of our population to particularly address several racial and rural um, disparities. So I'd love to talk to any of you more about how the center, it, to my mind, the, the, the center functions best when people who are at Duke and UNC and study Alzheimer's disease feel it is serving them well. So I would love to talk to you about how we can serve you well um, and how we can elevate the work that you're doing. All right, thank you. I think I'm next here. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the data side just briefly uh, and specifically what's uh what's available for folks uh within the duke community i'm brad hamill i'm faculty within the population health sciences department and the group i'm talking about today is pop health uh data share and it's it's interesting to talk about kind of the history of of this group because data share formally has only existed for the last about five years uh, as a formal entity, but it was originally part of a small group. And I was part of that small group at the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Um, we've been working with Medicare data for over 20 years. We found it very difficult to share those data with others at Duke to help others get access to the data resources that we had. I will say the one exception to this is uh, many of the folks on this, uh, this webinar today uh, 
we've worked with faculty and staff at SSRI for most of those years. And in some way they were like the exception that proved the rule. We had good close relationships with uh, some of the investigators over there, but getting other people access to these data was difficult. And so that, is, that led us to establish uh, the data share as a shared resource, which is an official school of medicine designation that allows us, allow us to do some, some more things. What that really did at Duke was centralize the management sharing of administrative claims data. Um, we also allowed us to argue that we needed a secure analytics platform for users, uh, and that's business specifically, just because the government was basically saying, I'm not sure you can hold our data unless you can prove that you've got this, this analytic platform. And finally, it allowed us to do some cost recovery with users so that we could expand our data holdings. So the data share solution, of course, it involved four different aspects. One is access to data. One is all about the governance of those data. We provide some resources to folks and I, I mentioned cost recovery briefly. I'll describe each of those just very briefly in a few slides, but all of those are really wrapped around the core data assets of the data share. Um, and that's where I'll spend the first few slides. Our biggest holdings are Medicare claims, and those are probably the most relevant to what we're talking about today, just because it's the federal health insurance program for folks over age 65 uh, in this country. We have over 20 years of data, a, a number of different cohorts of those data, including a 5% a sample of, of the, the US population. We also have 100% of inpatient claims. Um, the rest of the information on the slide is true of all claims data, right? So I, I won't necessarily go through it here, but once you have claims data, you have access to service dates and all the codes that, that show up on, uh, on those claims. And you know, helpfully, when people uh, are eligible and enrolled in the specific program. So Medicare claims is, is kind of where it all started and still one of our core, like the biggest uh, data asset. We also do, once we became a shared resource, we started talking with the NCDHHS to get access to the 100% Medicare uh, Medicaid data. And this was nice because it, it, it kind of helped fill in some gaps uh, of essentially population coverage, especially in, in the state since Medicaid is, it covers a lot of young people. In fact, 50% of enrollees in North Carolina are under 20 years old. Those data are current through 2021 and we refresh those multiple times a year. So the, the other piece of the puzzle, right, in terms of claims data between Medicaid and Medicare is some sort of commercial claims that covers uh, a whole different sector of folks. So we do have access to MarketScan. Of course, this is a database run by or currently managed by IBM, uh, but it includes commercial claims from a number of different uh, private insurers. And the exciting one, though, is that we're in contract kind of finalization right now to get the Blue Cross of Blue Shield North Carolina claims data. So I don't have many details on that, but um, if we talk next year, hopefully I'll be able to tell you all about the opportunities uh, for those data within, within the data share. So the other aspects of what the data share can do for folks, one of the big ones I would say is governance. Every single one of these databases has specific requirements um, and different requirements, to be honest with you. We have a lot of experience with navigating all those uh, pathways to approvals, and we can absolutely help folks navigate that as well so that you can get the approvals that you need to use those data. Uh, we've created several training modules that are distributed via the Duke Learning System. Some of these modules are required by us, others are optional, but they all allow, they all help users understand kind of how to work with the data assets and what they can and can't do uh, while they're working with those. We provide a number of tools to users. Now, the biggest tool, of course, is just the fact that there's uh, a Linux analytics server uh, that's provisioned with statistical software that folks can use. Um, and that's in the protected environment so that folks can look at PHI and PII without uh, any concern of that, that data getting out. In addition to the server, we have a number of different kind of um, things that are helpful to folks working with claims data generally. And that includes, you know, things like libraries of reference terminology. So you can decode your codes and also code lists uh, for certain comorbid conditions, outcomes or procedures so that you don't always have to start um, 
from scratch if you don't want to. And finally, we have a, a library of some SAS macros that, that might be helpful. Just two examples here. One is uh, ICD 9 to 10 code translation and the consumer price index adjustment. Uh, <clears throat> just again, so you don't have to do some of this stuff. Oh, there's, there's hopefully some, some value here uh, already for you. And finally, cost recovery is a big part of the data share. Um, it allows us to you know, maintain the data assets and grow the data assets. The pricing model is in some ways quite simple. Most every project pays an annual per project infrastructure fee. Um, if you have your own project management and biostatistical support, then you're kind of done there. But uh, one of the things DataShare also provides is a staff of programmers and statisticians and project managers that can help you with project management if you need have need for that, or can help you with analytics if you have need for that. And that's just charged uh, on an hourly basis and folks can help you kind of scope out what that, that cost might be for your project. And finally, and this is especially true with Medicare data, if you find that you need a specific cohort uh, defined in some way, whether that's by disease or procedure or a specific geographic area or something, it might be that you have to order data and we're happy to help you do that and just pass through the cost of, of that additional data. Um, so that's really all I had to say. Uh, we do have a website. You don't need to memorize the website. Just search for Pop Health Data Share and you can fill out a form there and we'll get in touch and we'll get in touch then with you and figure out how we can help you use claims data uh, here at Duke. Thanks so much. I'll turn it over to the next speaker now. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right, yeah, it's really, really excited. This is uh, Carl Hill from the Alzheimer's Association. I uh, see many of my colleagues and, and friends here are just, uh, just you know, really pleased to, to see this uh, uh, workshop series continue to develop. Uh, I remember but three years ago, Igor and I met at a GSA and had a, an idea of bringing the field together to discuss uh, methods and health disparities research. So uh, just, just excited. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, largest nonprofit funder of research in the world. And uh, we're certainly excited and, and uh, eager, you know, to learn more about ways of supporting researchers who, who have uh, uh, research questions and interests in health disparities research related to ADRD. So this conference is very meaningful from that uh, perspective. I'm hoping um, that there could be a, a few things that come from this meeting and that uh, continue to be part of, part of this meeting, the spirit of collegiality that Igor and I started and hopefully you know, everyone can uh, find ways to link and work together uh, because I think there's, there's so much power in, in building the network in that way. Uh, taking a look at the agenda, such scientific rigor, I think, in, and, and uh, almost all of those uh, levels of analysis in the NIA health disparities research framework. So, um, you know, you know, maintaining that rigor, and uh, you know, that is well reflected in the in the in the agenda as we see it there. So, thanks to the conference organizers and the speakers for for responding to that call. Really, really excited today. And then inclusion. You know, in my role, uh, new role as a chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer with the Alzheimer's Association, we're thinking critically about uh, inclu in, in, intentional inclusion. So that means uh, everyone you know, with, an, with an interest, with a research question, with a passion, has committed their careers to health disparities research, or is just starting to become interested, uh, can play a role in moving our field forward. So being intentional about our inclusion uh, and finding ways to get early career investigators uh, into, uh, into this momentum, established researchers at at uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Centers to think critically, like, like Heather said, about health disparities research. We'll need everyone, you know, everyone's uh, intentional uh, effort, you know, to move this forward and to understand, uh, the, you know, the, the take home here is to, to try to get a sense of, you know, what are some of these exposures, determinants over the life course that uh, present risk or it may, uh, you, know, you know, link to resilience for populations in, in, uh, in learning more about ADRD. So this is, this is really, really, really important and exciting. And then finally, perseverance. I mean, I, you know, we, we, last year this was online 
100% virtual and uh, we continue the momentum. I look at the room now, we have about 15, 20 people that have braved the, the pandemic to be together. And uh, that means that the spirit certainly is true. And I know we have many participants online as well. So, so thanks to everyone and looking forward to a wonderful uh, meeting. And for those of us that are here in person, a reception uh, later to continue our networking. So thanks to everyone. And uh, I look forward to the, the morning speaker. Thank you.